Amen. Well, hey, let's be uh, honest here. We're in church. How many of you slept an extra hour this morning, meant to come to the nine, and are here instead? Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Um, hey, did anyone uh, did anyone go to bed an hour early last night to account for the time change? Where, where the planners at? Are right, we have two? Um, how many of you had a good intentions to go to bed early and didn't? Okay. How many of you have young kids and any sleep goals whatsoever are irrelevant? You sleep when you can. Okay. We see you. We love you. Hey, my name is Ryan. I'm the children's youth and college pastor here at The Rock. And this morning, I want to talk about boredom. Everyone say boredom. Does anyone remember boredom? Like, do you remember the days before we had an iPhone that we could check at every waking minute? Like, do you remember the days when you had to stand in line at a coffee shop and you didn't have a phone to look at? You just had to stand there. Or like for the introverts, that moment of terror when the person in front of you would want to talk to you and you didn't have a phone to look at to avoid it. How many of you remember that? Like, I barely remember it. It's like a distant memory for me. Um, but but the, it's, it's boring. And then uh, we, my wife and I were on a plane flight just a couple weeks ago. And uh, we had downloaded a ton of movies onto our iPad to watch. And then when we got onto the plane, we had that moment of terror when we realized we forgot to charge our iPad and we might be bored on the flight. Can I just ask those of you that have more um, experience in the room, what did you do on flights before iPads? Like, did you talk? Like, what did you do? Like, look out the window. I can't even imagine it. And then I think one of the areas of life that's kind of the most mundane and boring that nobody told me about um, is, uh, as everyone said, get married. They said, it will be so awesome. It will be so fun. And then I got married. And then I realized most of marriage is like dishes and laundry. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It's like most of this is like just cleaning. Like, and, and obviously, I love marriage. My wife's amazing. She actually critiqued me after the 9 a.m. She said, you have to say nicer things about marriage. I love marriage. Um, but now we're like looking at the next season of our life. Like we're going to have kids someday. And, and look at that. I actually heard a young mom last week say this. She literally used this phrase, so many diapers. And so what you're telling me is that when we have kids, it's actually going to get more mundane and boring because we're going to have dishes, laundry, cleaning, and diapers. Why is most of life filled with really mundane things? And that in between the high moments of vacations and weddings and birthdays and celebrations, most of life is just doing normal things. So we're in this series called The Searching for Significance, and the tagline underneath is this, finding meaning in the mundane. Here's what I want to suggest. As followers of Jesus that believe in this story, uh, even the most insignificant moments of our life have meaning. And in particular, this morning, I want to talk about one area of our life that, if we're honest, uh, most of us might find really mundane and really boring, and that is our jobs. Maybe none of you find your jobs boring. Find your work, mundane. Uh, we work nine to fives. And by the way, when I'm talking about work this morning, I'm not just talking about uh, paid work. I'm also talking about the unpaid work, again, of dishes and laundry and all of this stuff. Work is anything that we do uh, for productivity that's not rest and relaxation. And, and here's my sense this morning is, I don't know if you ever heard a, a message on work in church before. Has anyone ever, ever heard a work sermon? Uh, here's the reality is we're a disciple church, which means we want to submit every single moment of our lives to discipleship to Jesus. And for a lot of us, that means the thing that we do to 40 to 60 hours a week called our work. Tim Keller says this in a book, Every Good Endeavor, which we're kind of going through the series. Some of you are listening to it in audiobook and reading along on Kindle or with the physical copy. Uh, but Tim Keller says this, work is so foundational to our makeup, in fact, that it is one of the few things we can take in significant doses without harm. So here's what I want to do this morning. Here's the main goal, is I want to change the way that we think about work. And here's how I want to change it. I want to change our thinking so that we know that our work is worship. 
And the second thing I want to do is give a fresh dose of hope uh, to a few people in the room. I feel like there might be some people in the room this morning uh, not in a physical work that's paid. I want to give you fresh hope and meaning for your life. I feel like there's some people in this room maybe on the verge of quitting their job. I want to give you fresh hope from God's word this morning. I feel like there's some of you uh, lost and feeling buried in the mundaneness and boredom of life, I want to give you fresh meaning and purpose this morning. And lastly, if there's some of us in here, I just sensed as I was praying just before the service, there's some of us in here, the idea of work fills us with so much stress and anxiety, whether it's because of finances and money not coming in, whatever it is, God wants to give fresh peace to our hearts this morning. So can we do that this morning? All right, Genesis chapter 1 says this. We're going to do that through a deep dive into Genesis 1. It says this. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image. Everyone say image. According to our likeness. And then watch this. He gives them a job to do. He says, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Your work is worship. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your presence that's here. Um, Lord, I pray for every person that's walking in this room this morning with a sense of preoccupation, with a sense of question marks and a sense of unsettling in their hearts. Just with eyes closed, how many of you would say, you know what, I'm bringing something uh, that's heavy on my heart to church this morning. Just lift your hand. I want to pray for you. Yeah, tons of hands. Lord, we pray for peace in this space, that this space would be a peaceful place to receive from you, and also a space where we can be honest with how we're really doing and not try and hype ourselves up. But God, we pray for grace to hear your word exactly where we're at. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Well, hey, to change our view about work, uh, we first have to kind of identify how are we thinking about our work right now. So we're going to do like a a BuzzFeed quiz. Is that okay? I'm going to give us four ways we view about work, and then you have to choose which one you tend to think about work as the most often, okay? All right, way number one. Way number one is this. The way that we tend to view work is, number one, we work to get to the weekend. It's something that we get through. We just got to get through this, and then it's Saturday, it's Friday. We just got to get through this, and then it's vacation, okay? Uh, Number two is this. We work to fulfill our passions and interests. And I would say for my generation in particular, uh, we've been told that we are very special and we have gifts and strengths and that work is a place where we realize our full potential. Uh, But really what that does is it makes work primarily about you. And so when work's not satisfying or when work is hard, which it is, uh, it can tend to be disorienting if we're primarily thinking about working as something to fulfill our passions and interests. Uh, Number three is this, we work to get something. And so this is a view of work that says work is an exchange. We work to get money Or maybe something deeper than that. We work to provide for our families, or we work to create a safe environment uh, for our kids. Or number four is this, uh, we idolize work. It's something that we overdo. And this is the one I am most guilty of. I think about my job a lot. Um, And it's something that goes beyond the boundaries for us of just a normal uh, assignment from the Lord, but becomes something that dominates our thoughts, dominates our thinking. Uh, So how many of you would say, just take a moment, pick which one do you most often identify with? Number one, how many of you would say, "I'm I'm a work to get to the weekend person? Just be honest. Be honest. This is an honest place, church. Thanks for your honesty. Okay. How many of you is number two? Two, we work to fulfill our passions and interests. How many of you? Awesome. Uh, how many of you? We work to get something. It's the exchange. I'm in it for the cash. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, or what's that phrase these days the kids are saying? Get the bread? Okay, get the bread. Okay. If you don't know what that is, it's a phrase that kids say. So number four, how many of you? It's the idolization of work. You overdo it, overdo it, overdo it. Thanks for your honesty. And, and some of these have good parts. Some of these have bad parts. Um, but I think as disciples of Jesus, we need to submit our view of work primarily to the story that's in this book. This is the way we think about work. And I want to do a deep dive into Genesis chapter 2 uh, to see what God has to say about work. So if you have your Bibles, you might actually want to turn there because we're going to read a lot of text uh, this morning. Well, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 says this, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work 
that he had done. And just a quick note right there, if you want to underline that, circle it, uh, that's actually the first time the word work is used in this story. And it's used to describe God's work of creation, creating heavens and the earth, plants and animals, land and sea. Uh, And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Here's the first point this morning, and this is actually quite profound if you think about it. Our God works. And it's actually really profound. If you think about it, if you study other world religions, you'll oftentimes find gods or deities that are distant and absent from reality and way up there. But our God actually creates reality as it is, and he works in it. And in fact, if you look at some of the other creation narratives that would have been written around this time, so if you're reading Genesis 2 as an ancient uh, Near Eastern person in that context, uh, you would have known a story called the Enuma Elish. And this was the Babylonian creation epic. Uh, and, And in the Babylonian creation epic, it tells this story of these gods that primarily fight. They primarily battle and they party, and they go back and forth between battling and partying, but they also try and, on the side, take care of the earth. And eventually, uh, if you read the story, they get tired of taking care of the earth, so they create humans as slaves so that they can have a nap. And isn't it profound? So you're reading Genesis 2 as an ancient Near Eastern Hebrew. You know that story. You know the common story is that the gods were tired, so they created humans as slaves. You read Genesis 2, and you see a God that loves to work and creates humans not as slaves, but as partners. Can I encourage you this morning, if you feel like a slave to your job or a slave to making money, you're actually more than that. You're you're partnering with God in your work on the earth. It's deeper than that. It's more profound. God himself works. Tim Keller in Every Good Endeavor says this, work did not come in after a golden age of leisure. Um, This is pre-fall, by the way. For those of you familiar with the story, you know in Genesis 3, something really negative is coming. Not only does God work, but humanity works before the fall. So it comes in not after a golden age of leisure, but it was part of God's perfect design for human life because we were made in God's image. And part of his glory and happiness is that he works, as does the Son of God, who said, my Father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. Work has value because it's something that God does. And aren't you glad that God doesn't approach his work like we so often do. Uh, John Ortberg has this uh, quote where he talks about how God works. Um, And I want to read it to you. We don't have the slides, um, so you you actually have to listen to me for a moment here. Can Can you listen? I trust you. You guys are awesome. So John Ortberg says this. This is him talking about how God would approach the work of creation if he were us. In the beginning... It was nine o'clock, so God had to go to work. He filled out a requisition to separate light from darkness. He considered making stars to beautify the night and planets to fill the skies, but thought it sounded like too much work. And besides, thought God, that's not my job. So he decided to knock off early and call it a day. And he looked at what he had done and said, it'll have to do. On the second day, God separated the waters from the dry land, and he made all the dry land flat, plain, and functional, so that, behold, the whole earth looked like Idaho. (laughs) He thought about making some mountains and valleys and glaciers and jungles and forests, but decided it wouldn't be worth the effort, so he said, it'll have to do. And God made a pigeon to fly in the air, and a carp to swim in the waters, and a cat to creep upon the dry ground. Aren't those the most boring animals? A pigeon, a carp, and a cat? And God thought about making millions of other species of all sizes and shapes and colors, but he couldn't drum up any enthusiasm for any other animals. In fact, he wasn't too crazy about the cat. And everyone said, amen. 
Besides, it was almost time uh, for the late show, so God looked at all he had done and said, it'll have to do. And by the end of the week, God was seriously burned out, so he breathed a big sigh of relief and said, thank me, it's Friday. <laughs> Aren't you glad that God didn't approach his work like, so, like we so often do? God approaches his work with a sense of purpose, a sense of joy, a sense of goodness. And here's the primary thing about Christianity is we don't discover who we are by looking inward. We discover who we are by looking upward. And so for us to understand our commission to work, we have to understand God himself as a God who works. And I would say in the story of Genesis, we see two primary jobs. If, if God had a job title, obviously there's many he holds throughout the pages of scripture, but just looking at Genesis chapter one and two, I think there's two he holds. And number one is this, God is a creator. Amen? God's a creator. So God's little resume in heaven says, God, creator. And number two, uh, and this is Genesis chapter two, kind of the next section. I'm going to read it, and then we'll talk about the um, uh, role that God plays there. But Genesis chapter two says, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In that day, the Lord God made the earth and the heavens when no plant of the field was yet in the earth. No herb of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain. And then verse seven, it says, then the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and then verse 9, it says, Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Here's what I would suggest, the second title from Genesis chapter 2. So he creates heavens and earth. And then Genesis 2 actually presents this beautiful picture where God doesn't just wave his magic wand from heaven to create humanity. He actually gets down and gets his hands dirty and forms humanity out of the dirt. And then he does the work of actually planting a garden. How many of you have ever gardened before? And it's probably more intense than that. I mean, we're probably talking about more, you know, large scale crops and things like that. God has to till the soil and plant the seeds. We get a picture of a God who gets his hands dirty. We're going to call this role of God cultivator. Everyone say cultivator. So he not only creates the word world, but he cultivates it. He takes care of it. And once again, this is so different from the Babylonian gods that went to take a nap. God actually enters into the word, cultivates, takes care of it. And once again, and as, as followers of Jesus, we don't discover who we are by looking inward. We discover who we are by looking upward. If God is creator and cultivator and we're made in his image, I think that says something about us too. So what about us? Have you ever been asked, uh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Have you ever been asked that question? So actually, uh, I didn't do it, but I found a really uh, cute video asking some people what they want to be when they grow up. So let's just take a minute. If you feel so inclined, what you can you say, aw. I want to be Can we say, ah, ah? There's, we are made in the image of God. There's something deep in us that's actually wired to work. We're wired to want to make a difference and have significance. We are wired to work. Have any parents of teenagers ever looked at your teenager and said, you have to get a job? 
It's actually theologically accurate. You do have to get a job. Uh, it's part of being human. And once again, I'm not just talking about paid work. I'm talking about unpaid work, things that are hard that give meaning and significance to this world. Tim Keller says it this way, work is as much a basic human need as, as food, beauty, rest, friendship, prayer, and sexuality. It is not simply medicine, but food for our soul. Without meaningful work, we sense significant inner loss and emptiness. People who are cut off from work because of physical or other reasons quickly discover how much they need work to thrive emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Um, I, I had a really sweet lady come up to me at the end of the 9 a.m. service, and she shared that for her, her first job she got when she was 11 years old uh, was to harvest strawberries. And she fell in love with harvesting so much. She actually spent uh, the greater part of her life uh, planting and doing the work of harvesting, uh, but now she physically is unable to do it. And so she says, now I get meaning and purpose because I'm a harvester of souls. And I thought, isn't that so beautiful that there's something in us that wants our life to be about more than just the mundanity? And really what that is, is that's image. That's image of God theology. So when we talk about that word image, when it says we're made in God's image, it's not just like a picture on a wall or a mirror reflection. The word image actually means biblically representation. Everyone say representation. And here's kind of the word picture I want you to think about is uh, a representation, an image of a god in the ancient Near East would have been like a little idol or statue. And so it was this image, and we have a picture of that image or representation of a god in statue form. But our god, the god of the universe, did not give us a statue to show us what he looked like. He actually gave us us. And that we as humans are image bearers of God and we're designed to represent him on the, work, on the earth. And one of the primary ways that we do that is in our work. So by working, we represent who God is. Our work is worship. Does that make sense? I mean, it's really significant. It's really profound. And, and so in that sense, work is not just for fulfillment. It's not just for an economic exchange. It's not just to get through it because you have to. It's actually fundamental to what it means to be human is to represent God in the creation and cultivation of the world. So let's dive into that just a little bit more. Uh, it, it, the, when in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So God creates and he cultivates things that are pleasant, meaning Beautiful. What does it pleasant to the side mean? It's pretty, okay? And things that are good for food. How many of you are thankful that God made good food? Okay, he wasn't just like, you know, here's these uh, white potatoes and eat this forever. Although if you deep fry white potatoes, they are actually some of the best food in the world. That's probably a bad analogy there. But you know what I mean? God, God made good food and, and he makes pleasant things and useful things. And so this is the mission of God is he creates and he cultivates an earth that is beautiful to point us to him and that's actually useful so we can have joy in the realities of our everyday life. Do you realize that the kingdom of God is not just this place that we go to when we die? Kingdom is not about running away from the world. It's actually about redeeming and restoring the world to its Genesis 1 beautiful and joyful state. And we, as representatives of God, made in his image, have a mission to participate in work in the redemption of a beautiful and useful world. Does that make sense? Mission is not just about um, evangelizing to our coworkers. Actually, the very work that we do is about creating a beautiful and useful world to the glory of God. Does that make sense? I can't tell you how many times I've been condemned. I'm not a, um, I just want to preach on this for a second. Like, I'll just be honest. Everybody's called to evangelize, but not everybody is an evangelist. 
Okay, how many of you are, would identify, yeah, I am an evangelist. That is a natural gift that I have. Um, anyone say that? How many of you, man, talking to strangers about my faith, I need the Holy Spirit's help to do that. Just be honest. Yeah, that's me. That's me. It's not my natural gift. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to work on it. I'm going to do it. It's my goal to do it once a week so I can become more like Jesus. But I can't tell you how many times I've condemned myself for not evangelizing as if that's the only mission I have to do on the earth. Do we realize our work itself as creating a beautiful, joyful, and useful world is actually a sense of mission? It's actually a sense that we partner with God, because if you notice what's about to happen in Genesis chapter 3 is there's an enemy that's about to come in, and he's about to make the world less beautiful, and he's about to make the world less joyful, and he's going to introduce some injustice. He's going to introduce some poverty. He's going to introduce some racism. He's going to introduce some of the chaotic things that make our world not as beautiful as God made it in Genesis chapter 1. And our commission as the people of God is to make the world more beautiful because we're in it. And that goes for all types of work. I think of even just the tangible picture, I heard a story about a family that noticed the loneliness in their neighborhood. How many of you think loneliness is not a beautiful thing? It's not a beautiful thing. And so they're like, man, this is not good. We want to make our neighborhood more beautiful. And so they decided instead of putting their picnic table in the backyard, they put it in the front yard so they could welcome their neighbors to eat with them. Our world should be a more beautiful place because we, as the people of God, are in it. But specifically this morning, we're talking about work, and we're talking about us. So let's kind of finish uh, reading Genesis chapter 2 uh, here in verse 15. It says this, it says, then the Lord God took man to put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. Everyone say, till it and keep it. And then uh, skipping down uh, to verse uh, 20, it says, then the man gave names to all cattle, all the birds of the air, and to every animal. Everyone say, names. So God creates humans in his image and gives them two jobs. Let me see if you were listening. What's the first job? Till and keep. Good job, Carolyn. Okay. Uh, number two, number two, what's the second job he gives him? To name. We're talking about God as a creator and as a cultivator. Do you realize that he actually gives Adam the same jobs to create names and cultivate the soil? So God creates Adam in his image. Adam's given these two jobs, create and cultivate uh, beautiful and useful things out of this soil. And let's kind of go meta here. Can you go meta with me? That means like big picture. Can you go big picture with me? <laughs> so God gives Adam the job just like God did. God, God got in the soil, planted seeds, harvested, did stuff with his hands. God gives Adam the job to do stuff with his hands in the garden. This is the work of things. Many of you actually have jobs in the work of things. You fix things. You build things. You, you, you do stuff with your hands. How many of you are gifted in that area? You're, you're, you're a cultivator like God and like Adam. You take care of the physical things of earth. And then if you want to go even bigger picture, uh, even from an anthropological perspective, if you look at the human history record, the moment when humans learned how to garden, how to, how to grow crops out of the soil, most anthropologists would say that's actually the moment that culture began. Because out of the garden and the earth, you learn how to build things and make things. And so uh, cities started to form around these things and buildings and architecture. So the commission for us to create culture in architecture starts in this moment in the garden. The commission for us to create beautiful laws even that glorify God starts in this moment in the garden. The, the tech industry starts in this moment in the garden. Do you realize this? All of human culture starts with this moment. It's our task as humans to create culture that glorifies God. Our task, friends, is not just to evangelize the earth. Our task is to redeem and restore the earth, to create beautiful and useful things. And so the second thing God commands Adam is create, or is names, name the animals. So this is the work of creation. Okay, this is the work of ideas. 
creating and naming something out of nothing. How many of you, uh, some, some people are better with things, some people are better with ideas. How many of you are the idea people, the strategists, the idea aiders, the marketers? This is in the garden too. That work is blessed and it's sanctioned and, and it's how we redeem and restore the world. I think the best illustration of this is all time, of all time, is actually someone named Jesus. Have you heard of him? Yeah. What was Jesus' job on earth? He was a carpenter. So if you think about it, the world, I mean, what if God of the universe had to come to earth, which he did, and choose a job, he actually picks the job of carpenter. I actually think there's some real significance in this, because what job uh, exemplifies more the task of creation and cultivation than creating beautiful and useful pieces of furniture for people to use? Like, this is a beautiful illustration, and I like to imagine that Jesus just didn't, like, hammer tables together and be like, that's it. I like to imagine he was a little creative in what he did, a little maybe artistic in what he did, but because the God of the universe became a person, Jesus, and built tables, it gives value to every practical thing that we do. Does that make sense? Because the God of the universe didn't come and just pray and worship all the time. He built things. He fixed things. He engaged in the tangibleness of life. What we do Monday through Friday actually matters. For those of you who hate doing the dishes, any dishes haters in the room, dishes is like the worst task in the house. Anyone, so a guy actually came up to me after the 9 a.m. and was like, you need to stop saying that. I love the dishes. Okay, who says that? Okay, who likes the dishes? Anyways, so thank you, Dylan. Okay, um, so uh, dishes, where was I going with that? I like to imagine, and this is probably totally stretching it, but Jesus had to have maybe washed a dish in his life. I don't know. It's crazy. But he did the normal practical things to give value to our normal practical things, which means the normal things of life we do matters. So the next thing you're doing something really normal, just say to yourself, Jesus must have done this. This matters. Your work is worship. Your work is worship. Um, I talked to, I think he'd be okay if I shared this, right? I talked to Mark in between services too, and he talked about how he felt a call to ministry on his life, and uh, he thought he would cut grass for a couple of years until the Lord sent him to ministry. He ended up cutting grass for 18 years before he got a ministry job, and he told me he was like, the only way I could have made it those 18 years is by understanding that this work was worship. It was unto the Lord. And for you, maybe that's a word of encouragement to you. Maybe you're stuck cutting grass for longer than 18 years. Your work is worship to the Lord. He loves it. So what, who do we have in this room? We got some cultivators. Uh, we got some mechanics and accountants, people that take care of things, construction workers, doctors take care of bodies, hospitality workers take care of people, pilots, technicians, IT people. How many of you are cultivators? Where are my cultivators at? I want to see you. You are made in God's image, and he loves you, and what you do is building a more beautiful world. Where are my creators at? Where are architects and educators and artists and entrepreneurs and researchers? If you're a student, this probably counts too. Marketers, where are you at? Where's the creators at? You are made in the image of God, and what you do is making a more beautiful world. And really, if you look at all the work that we do, it all kind of exists on this spectrum between creation and cultivation. It's not like you're, you know... Uh, locked into one of these categories. Some people have a cultivator job, but they're called to create a beautiful family. Uh, some people are called to create something beautiful in their work, but they're cultivating the dishes at home. Is that anyone's story? You have to learn the work of cultivation of the normal things in life. So we're all on this spectrum. Can we show that, that graphic there? Uh, and then in between the beautiful and the useful, this is the work that God does, and this is the work that we get to do. So I want you just imagine for a second, where would you put your job? 
your nine to five, or if you're a stay-at-home mom, where would you put stay-at-home mom kind of on this spectrum? I, I kind of imagined, hey, artists are creating beautiful things. People who are called to family are cultivating beautiful things. Police are cultivating useful things. Tradespeople are creating useful things. All of human work falls on this spectrum in the image of God. Isn't that beautiful? And so if we want to be a church that disciples leaders that transform culture, we have to disciple all kinds of disciples to transform all kinds of culture. The glory of God is not just in the church. The glory of God is in the nine to five you're going to show up to tomorrow. The glory of God is in the dishes at home. The glory of God is in you owning your assignment to cultivate and create a beautiful garden. The kingdom of God is not about running from the world. It's about redeeming and restoring the world that we're in. And that's kingdom. I want to give us just one last couple or one last illustration here. Uh, And so if someone wants to come up to the keys and then we'll pray. Actually, I want to show this quote from Andy Crouch in his book, Culture Making. I think this kind of sums up most of what we've talked about this morning. He says this. He says, what is happening here? What is happening is, in fact, central to the whole of Genesis 2, which depicts God making room for his image bearers to begin to grow into the vast cosmic purpose that was disclosed in Genesis 1. God is perfectly capable of naming every animal and giving Adam a dictionary, but he does not. He makes room for Adam's creativity, not just waiting for Adam to give a pre-existing right answer to a quiz, but genuinely allowing Adam to be the one who speaks something out of nothing, a name where there had been none, and allowing that name to have its own being. Adam, like his maker, will be both cultivator and creator. And I love that particular line, uh, he makes room for Adam's creativity. Can I say this? He makes room for your creativity too. I think one of the best illustrations of this is a man named Frank Laubach. And we have Frank Laubach's picture. So he was, he looks so goofy. I love it. But he was a, uh, uh, he was trained in some of the finest universities in America. Uh, and he went to work at, is a, at a seminary in Manila in the Philippines. And at a certain point of his life, both his wife and his three kids died of malaria. He got seriously ill, and his seminary that he was working at closed. And so he found himself alone in the Philippines, an insane education amongst people who were really, at that point in time, did not have an education. And he was standing there saying, God, what am I supposed to do? And he felt kind of that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. How many of you ever had that still, small Holy Spirit nudge? He feels a still, small nudge of the Holy Spirit. And and the Holy Spirit says this, says, uh, you can't love the people you're serving because you think you're superior to them. And so so the first job he has to do is he has to cultivate the environment of his heart. And so he begins this journey of trying to practice every moment in the presence of God. And he recorded this book. It's a book called Game with Minutes. And his goal was to every single minute remind himself that the presence of God was with him. And as he goes on this journey, you can read it in his book, God starts to transform his heart. He falls in love with the people he's serving. And he actually begins to do some literacy work with the people. And he sees their literacy rates increase like crazy. Uh, But then what happens is is he starts to get funding from an outside source. It explodes. The funding once again gets cut. And the chief looks at all the people who are educating them and says, if you don't keep doing this, you'll die. And so he says, oh no, Uh, let's do this a little bit better. I'm not going to kill you. But he comes up with this phrase, each one, teach one. And just like that, the world literacy movement was born. And this man had an audience with President Harry Truman. This man had an audience with most major government leaders in his day. He's responsible for a a, a literacy movement in India, all across the East. And it's a beautiful example, I think, of someone who cultivated a gift, practiced the presence of God, and created a more beautiful world because of it. So here's what I want to ask this morning. Let's, let's go ahead and stand up. Let, let's get our blood flowing. I just want to ask us two questions. 
Actually, before I ask those two questions, before I ask those two questions, take this away for a second. I don't want people to get distracted. I want to say, I want to say three things. I want to say three things. It's number one is this. If you feel ready to quit your job, God wants to give you hope this morning that what you're doing matters. If you feel like you're lost in the boredom, in the mundanity of life, I want to encourage you, what you do matters. And if you feel lost in the stress and anxiety of work and finances and trying to work it all out, God is with you in it and he has a purpose in it. Here's the two questions I want to ask is number one is where is your garden? Where is that nine to five, that house, that business, that place that God's called you to cultivate, that classroom, that where's your garden? And how is God calling you to either create or cultivate, take care of that garden? I just want to take a moment. And then if you feel like you're ready, you feel like you got it, just go ahead and close your eyes, put your hands on your heart, just respond to the Lord. Once again, our work is worship. And so I want to create a space in this place for us to respond in our hearts and say, Lord, I want to do this as worship to you. I actually feel like first, I feel like there's some people in the room, uh, you actually need to repent for the way that you've thought about your job or your assignment. If that is, again, being a something in the home or something like that, your, your work, whether it's paid or unpaid. I just feel like for some of us, uh, we need to actually repent. We've thought very negatively about it. We've viewed it as something we need to get through or, you know, kind of we've, we've, we've relegated it just to financial exchange and God's kind of calling you upward in the way that you think about your job, just with eyes closed all across the room. How many of you, that's you, you want to ask the Lord for a change of thinking? related to your job. Just lift your hands. Yeah, God, we just pray for grace all across this room. Romans chapter 12 says that we'd be transformed by the renewal of our minds. God, we pray that you would renew our minds related to work, related to the place that you've assigned us. Again, just with eyes closed, I feel like there's some people in the room, you actually feel ready to quit your job. And I'm not necessarily saying don't quit if it's the right move. Obviously, it's the right move, but you just need some fresh encouragement in that space. Just with eyes closed, could you slip your hand up? I want to pray for you. God, we just pray for encouragement for people that are wondering if this is worth it, wondering if this nine to five has any fruit. God, we thank you for the gift of all types of work, all types of industries, the way that they create a beautiful and useful world. And God, I pray for a fresh hope for those who feel discouraged in their job. And then the last thing I want to pray for is this, and the prayer team can come up to the front and just get ready. Uh, again, just with eyes closed, the idea of work fills you with so much stress and anxiety. Your work creates a stressful state in your brain, or maybe the need to get finances is a constant state of anxiety for you. I just want to pray for you. So once again, eyes closed, last thing, if that's you, can you lift your hand? I want to pray for you. God, we pray for peace. Peace for the stressful mind. Peace for the stressed out heart. God, thank you that you're a provider. You know what we need. We want to partner with you and represent you well in this world. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. We'll bless you guys. If you